Thank you. And now you know all of us. And we let me just explain how we are going to proceed. We will be asking you questions, and uh, we may interrupt you at any stage, so feel comfortable with that. You are also free to, to seek clarification uh, so that you are comfortable in the area that you are responding. And we will start now very briefly. You introduce yourself, who is Professor Makao Mutua. And the two, you give us, or you highlight your experience regarding each role of our Chief Justice. Um, thank um, the Commission and the Chairperson uh, for giving me this opportunity to uh, speak with you about my qualifications for the position of the Chief Justice of the Republic of Kenya. I am grateful for the opportunity to be here today. Um, uh, I am Makao Mutua. I am a SUNY Distinguished Professor at the State University of New York uh, at Buffalo. Um, I was dean there from 2007 uh, to uh, 2014, December 2014. I was educated uh, at the University of Nairobi, University of Dar es Salaam, and at Harvard Law School, where I obtained my terminal law degree a doctorate of juridical science. Um, I practiced law in New York City uh, with a law firm of White and Case in 87 and 88. And thereafter, I joined the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights. Some of you may know the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights. It is now called Human Rights First, um, where I was um, a attorney uh, doing asylum cases for refugees, and then uh, later from 1991, uh, from 1989 to 1991, I was the uh, director of the Africa Project of the same organization, the Lawyers Committee. Uh, thereafter, I uh, went to Harvard Law School, uh, where I was uh, the uh, project director at um, the Human Rights Program. Um, and since 1996, I have been a professor of law in Buffalo, New York. Um, I think that you know my work in this country. Um, I started the Kenya Human Rights Commission uh, together with uh, the ex-Chief Justice, William Mutunga, in 1991. And I have served in that capacity as chair of the commission uh, since that time. Um, the Commission has been involved in many, many activities, as some of you know, uh, including producing the Mado Constitu Constitution in 1994, um, Katiba to Itakayo. I think, uh, Winnie, you remember that. Um, I was also, um, uh, from 2003 to 2004, a delegate to the Kenya Constitutional Conference at Bomas, I was a delegate there um, in the liberations that ended up giving us the current constitution. I, um, I also led the Truth Commission Task Force in 2003, uh, which produced a report, and that report um, became the basis for the eventual establishment of uh, the Truth Commission that uh, that, that uh, concluded its work uh, uh, some time ago. Uh, as, as for uh, my knowledge of the judiciary, I have paid very close attention to the goings on in the judiciary. Uh, I just want to highlight one, one, one thing, and that is that uh, I have uh, done some scholarship on Kenya's judiciary. I authored one of the first um, law review articles on the judiciary way back in 2001. And I think my fellow professors, uh, Professor Mugai and uh, Professor Agenda, uh, uh, probably have knowledge of that, of that piece of work. I've also written a book on the constitution making process in Kenya. Uh, this book was published in 2008. And I brought a coffee here. 
Uh, just in case uh, there's a question about the book, we can refer to it. Um, I was also involved with the World Bank, uh, where I have been a consultant, uh, working on the Judiciary Performance Improvement Project. In fact, uh, I, I was in Kenya in May as part of a World Bank mission, and I met some of you uh, in, that, in, the, in that process. Um, I was advising the bank on, on the project and um, its implementation. I should also add, in that respect, um, uh, I had a hand in helping the, 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 the bank uh, advance the loan uh, to, to the judiciary uh, way back in 2012. Um, you know, so I am familiar with, um, with, with your work as a judiciary. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Let me uh, invite uh, Commissioner Hedu to start off with our set of questions. I'd like on behalf of my colleagues to welcome you again to this interview. I, for my part, would like to make a very few, very few clarifications relating to the very impressive qualifications that uh, you have placed before the commission. First, <coughs> Your documents indicate that you first registered as a law student at the University of Nairobi. How long did you last in that institution? Guy, thank you for the compliment. Um, you also have an impressive resume yourself, so I, I want to return the compliment. Thank you. Um, I was a student um, at the University of Nairobi from 1979 to May 1981. Was that two years or one year? That was two years. Two years. So you, you made it to second year of the Nairobi University curriculum? Uh, actually, I almost finished uh, my second year. Um, but as, uh, as fate would have it, uh, I was, as some of you know, a student leader uh, at the time. Uh, we. Uh, organized students to protest the closing of political space, the denial of basic freedoms. Uh, we demanded that, um, uh, that the states open up uh, political competition uh, and accord Kenyans basic human rights. Eventually, you graduated with the degree of Bachelor of Laws from uh, the University of Dar es Salaam. Yes, I did. So it is true to say that your basic qualifications in law are the LLB of the University of Dar es Salaam. Uh, well, um, I think that's correct to say. That's ex correct. Except, except uh, uh, Professor Mugai, I may just add that um, when, I tr when I was expelled from uh, Nairobi, uh, I went into exile in Tanzania, and Professor Kodo Gendo, the late Professor Kodo Gendo, was kind enough to forward my transcripts to the University of Dar es Salaam uh, for my first year, which I had completed. And those transcripts were then uh, uh, accepted by the University of Dar es Salaam in admitting me to the second year of the law school there in Dar es Salaam. So in fact, I completed uh, the second year of law school there, and the third year of law school there in Dar es Salaam. Right. We from the University of Dar es Salaam. Yes. Uh, which was a course taught largely on uh, the law of the United Republic of Tanzania. Um, I, um, I think that is partly true and partly untrue. I see. Um, it is, um, as I recall uh, from my, it's now a long time ago, it's over 30 years, but uh, as I recall from my, my curriculum at the time, um, the coursework itself was not very different from the coursework that um, I had under undertaken. But Professor, they couldn't have been teaching the law of, of Kenya in Tanzania any more than they could be teaching the law of Uganda in Zambia. 
So I think we can overcome this little point by agreeing. You took an LLB degree of the University of Dar es Salaam, which was based on the law of Tanzania. And we can move on. Uh, I, uh, Professor Mugai, I think I, I, I do not want to, uh, to, to, to be stuck on this point, but I just want to say that um, uh, the law schools in East Africa uh, have you know, run very similar cu curricula. Um, and again, as I recall, much of the case law that I learned uh, in, in, in Dar es Salaam was very similar to the case law in Nairobi. So I mean, took an LLM from Dar es Salaam. Yes, I did. What thesis did you write for that LLM? Uh, I wrote on um, the, <clears throat> the laws governing uh, direct foreign investments um, in East Africa. Okay. Yes. And after that, you then went to the United States and uh, were admitted at the Harvard University Law School. Yes. Where again you took the LLM and later the JSD. Yes. In fact, uh, as I recall, Professor Mugai, we were there around the same time in the United States, if I'm not mistaken. You do me a great service. Not everybody believes I'm educated like you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <coughs> yes, Professor. But uh, <coughs> I want to, uh, again, uh, get a sense of what you are studying at this time. Uh, for the LLM and for the JST, yes. is it right to assume that you are concentrating on uh, international law uh, uh, models because you later become a professor of international law? Um, what I did uh, for my uh, <coughs> master's in law at Harvard was to take a mixture of uh, business law classes international law classes, but also some basic um, um, you know, uh, law classes, including environmental law uh, uh, in, in, in at Harvard. Uh, what I wanted to do there was to get a broad exposure to, uh, to the law uh, in the United States, because at that point, I did not know what my fate was. Uh, I could not return to Kenya. Uh, and so I was prepared for a life uh, of legal practice in the United, uh, States. In the United States. So Prof, I, I, Prof, I, 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 I expose myself broadly to, to U.S. law. Professor, okay. respond to a, a critic, shall we say, who, mm -hmm. who would ask you, uh, uh, Professor, with all this very distinguished learning, how much of the law of Kenya do you know? I think that, um, uh, you know, first of all, let me say that um, I am no stranger uh, to my country. Uh, I have been deeply involved in the professional, political, economic, and social life of this country uh, ever since I was a child. Now, it is true that uh, I have lived abroad for a long time, and you know, the facts are evident uh, on that score. Uh, but I will challenge anyone uh, who knows this country to go toe to toe with me on the basic facts of this country's body politic, uh, including, in fact, uh, matters of the legal profession. Um, I have, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, you know, lived in two continents at the same time, if that is possible. Uh, uh, in as much as uh, I'm a professor of law in the United States, I, I live and breathe uh, this country. Uh, professor, I think that most people around this table and in this country would concede that your knowledge of uh, the constitutional history of this country is quite good. It's outstanding. It's demonstrated in some of the uh, very good writings that have been perused by uh, learned professors and their students. 
But the work of the Chief Justice is, a, is, is, is about the enforcement of the law of Kenya. You can see around this room, and Professor, <laughs> there are about 700 different statutes yes. that constitute the law of Kenya, other than the Constitution. Yes. And uh, I myself would like to be convinced that the Chief Justice of the Republic of Kenya is mm. familiar with mm -hmm. the Landlord and Tenant Act, is familiar with the Matrimonial Property Act, is familiar with uh, the Insolvency Act, and, and all the other statutes that constitute our law. Uh, quite frankly, from uh, what you've shared with us, it doesn't appear like you know enough about the rest of our law other than the Constitution. So let me... Um, <coughs> Um, let me respond to you, uh, Professor Mugai. Um, I don't regard uh, the job of a Chief Justice as that of a legal mechanic uh, dealing with the minutia of the law. Um, I regard the Chief Justice uh, as the intellectual leader of the judiciary whose job is to provide a vision uh, for a judiciary that um, uh, uh, has fidelity to the values and the norms of the Constitution. Um, uh, the, the second, uh, I think, aspect uh, of the Chief Justice's job uh, is to work with this body uh, to oversee the judiciary in all its various aspects. That's a very administrative uh, uh, aspect of the job, although it also includes vision, because part of what you do as a JSC is to hire judges, is to you know, uh, uh, address personnel matters relating to judges, including discipline and so on and so forth. Um, so I regard the Chief Justice as, as a, uh, an individual whose job is to lead, to inspire, and to provide a vision for the judiciary, and to work with the other arms of government. With respect to the particular question that you are raising and where you are going with it, um, I think, as, as, as you know, Professor, uh, the training that we provide our students uh, is not about specific statutes. It is not, we don't ask our students to, 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 to sort of memorize and commit to their minds sections of, of particular laws and, and uh, regulations. What we ask our students to do is to understand how to work with the law, how to interpret the law, um, how to elucidate it. Uh, and in that respect, um, and I've always taught my students this, um, I think lawyers essentially are trained not as craftsmen or as tradesmen. They are trained as, as, as intellectuals for the most part. But professor. They work <coughs> with norms. And so, and so, and so if, you know, if I may just finish this thought, it is that um, what is important, it is not that I know the chapter and verse of the law of tenancy. It is that I can work with the norms in that particular statute. Professor, and you know, therefore better than I do, that the reason you are able to command the respect of your professors and your, and your teaching staff is because they know that the dean, the professor, knows. If they thought the professor didn't know, yes. it wouldn't um, undermine completely your authority. If we appointed you chief justice, mm. and every resident magistrate in, in Kenya entertains mm. a doubt mm. as to the chief justice's knowledge of the law mm. in general, mm. wouldn't that undermine your authority? I think it would, uh, Professor Mulgai, but the fact of the matter is that um, the magistrate who would doubt my knowledge of the law would be sadly mistaken. Uh, 
uh, this, this is because, as I've said before, um, if you are trained to work with the law, all you need to do is to pick up a statute and work with the norms in that statute. Okay, problem. Knowledge is not mechanical. It is not. It is not. Uh, it is not uh, chapter and verse. I hear it, you. It's, on it's, that. Not, it's normative. I hear you on that. Let's la try and find out yes. how much of actual interaction with the law in the context of dispute resolution that you have had. Mm -hmm. It would appear to me that you have had only one year at Case and White as an associate. Yes. We will count that year in your favor as yes. a practice of law. Yes. Uh, thereafter, you have uh, a short stint in an NGO that you have shared with us called uh, uh, Human Rights. But the law is committed for human rights. And there again, you, it's a short period. Yes. Um, for two so years. It is, two true, years. it is true then to say that it, there isn't, <clears throat> in this your very distinguished legal career, mm -hmm. there is nothing to suggest that dispute resolution, litigation, mediation, uh, arbitration mm -hmm. have had a, an important uh, uh, attention from you. Um, I would say that um, the practice of law is a very large canvas. Uh, it is not limited to a particular aspect uh, of working with the law. Um, I think you know as well as I do that we teach and train our students as lawyers to perform many functions in society and that we do not uh, create a hierarchy of practice areas uh, as professors when we produce students. Now, I'm very proud of my legal experience. Um, I went to White and Case uh, because I wanted to be exposed to the traditional practice in a, in a large American firm. As well, you that know, period is too short, Professor. I'm, I'm coming to you. <laughs> so uh, I, 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 I got what I wanted there. You know, um, I kept very long hours, um, and and I thought that I, for at least the traditional aspects of legal practice, that I had been, I, I was able to get to get the basic uh, the basic parameters. Um, after all, my interest was not in uh, as a lawyer. My interest has not primarily been uh, in sort of, if you will, uh, courtroom experience as a lawyer. That was not my, that, that has not been, that not, that's, that's not been my, my, my interest. My interest has been, quite frankly, if you look at my resume, um, focusing on the, on the relationships between the state and the individual in a number of, a number of areas. And you have done a very Most good job. Most principally in problem. human rights. You've done a very good job. <coughs> what I am concerned about is I'm looking at the profiles of uh, Supreme Court justices in the United States, from the Chief Justice John Roberts, who you must be familiar with. Yes. If you look at the trajectory of their careers, yes. you find this involvement with multiple facets of what lawyers do. Yes. At one point, uh, he's working in a private law firm, at another one, he's in the attorney general's office. At the other one, he's clerking for a judge. At another one, he's an academic. That, that kind of, uh, uh, you know, that texture there, that gives me a bit of comfort that the chief justice has this command of, of the entire canvas, as you call it. And I see that in uh, uh, Ginsburg, associate Supreme Court professor, you know the work she did on women's rights and equality and teaching and setting up uh, law center. I don't see anybody, either in the UK or in the US or in South Africa or in India, whose trajectory mirrors yours, that is straight from the academy to the top echelon of the, of the judicial system. 
Well, first of all, um, let me just say that I think um, the assumption that you're making that I don't have exposure to these different facets of legal practice is one that I contest. Uh, and, you know, there are, there are only 24 hours in a day, as you know, uh, and 365 days in a year. And so you are limited by what you can do in, within that period. Agreed. I think that um, I have an exposure to traditional legal practice. I think I've worked at a human rights NGO, uh, you know, the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights. Uh, I think I have run, if you will, a Truth Commission task force in this country whose purpose was to uh, excavate past abuses with a view to, to creating a, a process for, for justice and healing. I think that's uh, very relevant and leg legitimate experience that Chief Justice Roberts of the United States has not had. Uh, I was involved in the making of a constitution, Professor Mogai. That counts for something. I don't think that Chief Justice Roberts has a, that kind of experience. Um, I have advised governments uh, uh, you know, uh, conform their laws to human rights standards. I have sat, as you know very well, on the boards of international legal organizations in which I have played you know, key roles. So in fact, I would say that if you look at the breadth of, of my experience as a legal professional, my canvas is probably wider than that of Chief Justice Roberts. Okay, I'm satisfied with that answer. Let me take you to a more mundane issue. <coughs> Please open your constitution, which is provided for you there. Yes, I have it. I, want I you. brought it, I brought mine. You brought your own, yes. a wise lawyer yeah. does yes. that. Bring your own constitution. <laughs> yes. Article one, two. Okay, just a minute. Yes. Each judge of a superior court shall be appointed from among persons who A, hold a degree from a recognized university, or are advocates of the High Court of Kenya, or possess an equivalent qualification in a common law jurisdiction. Yes. What is your qualification under that heading? Um. Obviously, I hold a law degree from a recognized university. And we concede that point. Yes. Let us go to B. Okay. Possesses the experience required under clause three to six as applicable, irrespective of whether that experience was gained in Kenya or in another Commonwealth common law jurisdiction. What is your qualification under B? A clause three to, to six. Mm -hmm. Let's, let me help you. Yes. Three A, you have not been a superior court judge. So yeah, that no, doesn't apply to you. I have not. Uh, you don't have, 50, you have 15 years experience as a distinguished academic. Yeah, certainly 3B is applicable to me. Okay. Yes. Uh, you are not a judicial officer, that doesn't apply to you. No. You are not a legal practitioner, or, or that doesn't apply to you. Yes. Now, let us interrogate this distinguished academic. Yes. We have been advised by experts in this matter that the distinction in the academy anticipated by 3B is subject to 2B and must have been obtained in a commonwealth, common law jurisdiction. Where did you obtain your academic distinction? I, uh, first of all, I, I must say that um, I don't read, um, you know, section 166 to B um, and three uh, B, not three B, three three A, in the way in which you are reading it. Uh, I I I would like to know what um, uh, expert uh, advised you uh, in that in that fashion because I challenge their reading of the Tell constitution. Tell us what you understand to B 
in another common law, commonwealth, common law jurisdiction. What do you understand that to mean? Uh, I think that um, um, I think that uh, you know we, my understanding of a common law jurisdiction. Common law. Common law jurisdiction. Commonwealth, common law. Yes, I, I, I simply would say that um, uh, that um, that the only connection I would have, I, I would draw between myself and that um, uh, to be, is my work in Dar es Salaam. Number one. Which does not amount to 15 years. So secondly, let's remove it from the table. Secondly, I would say that my work in this country, uh, with among others, the Kenya Human Rights Commission, since 1991. But that's not w academic work. You know your distinction, the distinction we are happy to accord you mm -hmm. is the distinction of an academic. And yeah, the Constitution is telling us mm -hmm. that distinction must be for 15 years yes. in a commonwealth, common law jurisdiction. Yeah, but like, as I said, uh, uh, Professor Mugai, I contest that um, that, that 2B, 166 2B, um, refers solely to academic experience. Okay, let me, let me take you back uh, to 2A. Yes. The draftsman, or woman, as the case may have been, mm. the, the draftswoman is very careful in 2A. Mm. She says that you hold this degree, yeah? Mm -hmm. from a common law jurisdiction. She's very clear. You hold the degree from a common law jurisdiction, and that's a qualification. No, 2A, 2A, uh, 2A Professor Mugai, 2A, the first um, limb of 2A, refers to holding a law degree. I'm talking about the, th the third limb. Yeah, but, uh, but. Or possesses an equivalent qualification in a common law. Yeah, but I'm not concerned about uh, the second and third limbs since the first limb is sufficient no, for, no, no. for my purposes. No, no. I am. And oh, please help okay. me. Okay. I am trying to demonstrate that the draftswoman mm. is not confused here. Mm. She is very clear what she's trying to do. Mm. In 2A, she wants the equivalent qualification to be a qualification in a common law jurisdiction. Uh, with all due respect, uh, Professor Mulgai, I think we, we just must part company there, uh, in spite of the high regard with which I hold your interpretive mind. Uh, I think that the first limb of 2A stands alone. Yeah, yeah, I'm not bothered about that, as yes. I have said. Yes. 2A has three limbs. Yes. One is the law degree from yes. a recognized university. Yes. Two is being an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. Yes. I'm not bothered about those two. Yes. I'm bothered about the third, which yes. is yes. the candidate possesses an equivalent qualification yes. in a common law jurisdiction. And, and my argument with you is... I think you have not understood the point I'm trying to make with respect. I Can I please make it? Yeah, go ahead. The, the reason that co the, the draftsman uses a common law distinction is purposeful. Mm. And you will understand the purpose mm. when you go to 2B. Mm. Because in 2B, she then says mm. that the candidate must possess the qualifications between 3 and 6, okay? Mm. Whether that experience has been gained in Kenya or another commonwealth, common law jurisdiction. My contention is this. Mm. She introduces a new nuance. Mm. It is not enough that you have a common law qualification. Yes. It must be a commonwealth, common law jurisdiction. Now, my question to you, Professor, is can this. I be, before you ask the question, can I, can I just interject? OK? Uh, the, actually, to, um, the second name of 2A, uh, refers to an equivalent qualification in a common law jurisdiction. Exactly. Well, I submit to you that the United States is a common law jurisdiction. 
That's why we are not bothered about okay. two A. But I also want to say this uh, before you ask the question. I think you are torturing the uh, the provision. Which one? Two A. Two A. Yes. Or two B. I think you are torturing both both of the provisions because I think, um, w with all due respect, I think that uh, the 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 uh, the criteria for the qualification for the chief justice are not to be read mechanically. Uh, or in a way that um, you know that does not look at the normative intent of this particular section. The normative intent is very clear. You know that either you are an academic uh, who is distinguished, either you are an advocate who has practiced for a long, long time, or you are a judge who has sat for a long time. That is the essence, in my view, of this particular. On the contrary, uh, on the contrary, the draftsman is very clear. If you are a distinguished academic, that distinction must have been obtained in a commonwealth, common law country. Okay. That you are distinguished in Chinese law or Russian law or the law of the aborigines is something that the draftsman has ruled out. You must be distinguished in the law of a commonwealth, common law country. Question now, wait for the question, Professor. Okay. Is the United States of America a commonwealth, common law jurisdiction? No, it is not a commonwealth, common law jurisdiction. And I'm happy with that. I can move on to something okay, please. else. Bush versus Gore. Yes. You were in the United States when this dispute erupted after the election that Al Gore lost to the incumbent, George Bush. Did you follow the proceeding? I, I think it's correct to say that um, our goal, um, I, that rather George Bush uh, was declared president by the Supreme Court. George Bush was declared president by the Supreme Court. Yes. Is there any other mechanism? As opposed, to, me saying, as opposed to saying our goal lost to George Bush. OK. <laughs> but we must, the finality of what the finality of what political contests mean mm -hmm. is in the preserve of the judiciary. Is it not? The finality of political contests in a democracy um, uh, is in the ins ins institution that is charged with pronouncing on, that, on the finality of a, of a dispute. Which is what the Supreme Court of the United States did in Al versus Go, or, or in Bush versus Go. But what I'm saying to you, uh, Professor Mugai, is that uh, there are other bodies within the United States. I understand. Which can also declare an election. I understand. Yes. Learned professors yes. can write several articles on one side. Yes. Another set of professors can write articles on another on side. On the other side, that's true. But the public will ask, what did the court say? You agree with that? I think the public will ask, what would the court say, depending upon the credibility uh, and the confidence that the public has in the court. In the, in the Republic of Kenya, the Supreme Court of the Republic of Kenya, after hearing arguments, by counsel for all parties, pronounced itself on the case of Raila Odinga versus Uhuru Kenyatta and others, and pronounced the election to be one that they could not disturb on the basis of their appreciation of the law. You, you recall that? Uh, only too well. And uh, arising out of that, the President of the Republic and his deputy were sworn into office. Yes. You have been quoted in several publications as saying that you do not recognize either the, uh, the finding of the court or the instruments that brought the, uh, the, uh, the current administration to office. Do you still persist with that view? Well, I, I do not think you are referring exactly to uh, my words. I think you are paraphrased. Uh, I, don't, I don't have the exact words in front of me, so both of us may be at a, at a disadvantage in recalling what exactly I said. Uh, but I think the question that you raise is very important, and I'm glad that you've raised it, because I would like to answer it. 
for the benefit of this august body, uh, the JAC, and the Kenyan people at large. Uh, because the Kenyan people must have confidence that if I am fortunate enough to be chosen by you, first of all, to be Chief Justice, that they can trust me, uh, that I have good judgment, that I have good moral values, that I'm a person who can uphold the Constitution of this and the laws of this country. I think that's where your question is going to, that's right. uh, as a matter of fact. Um, so let me just uh, 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 preface my remarks by saying the following. Uh, you know, that both you and I, and I think every commissioner here, exist in several realms. You know, there is the private Gidumui guy, if I may remove the professor and the AG from you know, the prefix. And then there's A.G. Moigai, right? There is Professor Moigai. Uh, what Professor Moigai will do may not be what Attorney General Moigai will do. In fact, what Professor Moigai will do may regard what uh, Attorney General Moigai is doing to be repugnant. Okay? I mean, uh, it's a hypothetical, and the same applies to me. Um, now, there is the citizen, Macau Matua. There is the professor, Macau Matua. And uh, chief justice. And there could be the chief justice, Macau Matua. Uh, um, may that come true. Um, let me just say that uh, citizens have a right of, right of conscience. And what uh, our system of government is based upon the notion that dissent is a fertilizer for democracy. That dissent is good. Okay. okay. <coughs> Prof, I have understood you. Yeah. You're and, saying, yeah. and I agree, mm. I, I am willing to meet you halfway. Okay, meet me that halfway. That you have pronounced yourself. Yes on these matters yes. in several capacities, as a scholar, as an intellectual, as, a, as, a, as an activist, as a, as a philosopher, as a man of ideas. Yes. But if you were to be given the Bible, hmm. uh, you would be bound by section 1661, if you look at it. Yes. 1661. Yes. The president shall, shall appoint. You are telling us you would have had you would have very little difficulty from accepting the oath of office from uh, the president of the Republic of Kenya. Let me just say this, uh, uh, Professor Mugai, uh, that um, um, I'm sure you are aware of the Bangalore principles, uh, as I'm sure are some of uh, the judges here. Is that what an academic writes uh, and opines? Uh, in the course of uh, their profession uh, is no grounds uh, for uh, dismissal for them if they do seek judicial office or if they want to hear a case, it is not ground for recusal, as we know very well. Um, what I want to make clear to you is that there is a distinction between Citizen Macau, who has a right to dissent, and Chief Justice Macau Mutua, who is sitting as a Chief Justice of the Republic of Kenya. Let me just say this uh, for clarity. I have never said in all my pronouncements on this question, and I think this is an important point I want to make. I have never said that uh, Mr. Kenyatta was not declared president and confirmed as such by our Supreme Court. I have said that I disagree with the opinion of the court, but I respect the opinion of the court. You know, I disagree with it, but respect it. Um, and what I have said is that if I was sitting in that court myself, 
Maybe I could have this, I don't know what I could have done. Maybe I could have dissented. Maybe I could have joined the majority. Who knows? Suppose I dissented. Would that now make me unfit to serve as a judge of the Supreme Court? I guess not. No. Because, because our system is based upon dissent. You know, so, so if a judge had dissented in the Supreme Court in that, in that particular case, uh, I don't think that we, we would be walking around saying that um, he is not fit to serve. Yeah? So in fact, the infraction, the infraction that you're accusing me of uh, is even more minute because I dissented as a private citizen. Secondly, let me just say this. Um, Only I have made no accusation. Yeah. I have just sought to know whether you would uh, <laughs> alter your conduct yeah, yeah, to but, but be consistent with your new responsibilities. Yeah, let me That's just finish, the, finish my, my point, because I think it's important to, to finish my, my train of thought here. Sure. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, the question um, of um, recognition of uh, a government is a legal question in international law, as you know very well, okay? When I was speaking in this context, I was speaking as a private citizen, okay? I was not speaking in the sense in which international lawyers speak about recognition of a government, okay? You can, you can, you can, uh, you can, you can, in, even in families, people, disagree and dissent. I have kids, you know, who I say we're gonna, we're gonna go to Bahamas for Christmas, they say no, we're gonna do something different, you know? What do I do with them? Do I excommunicate them, disinherit them? Of course not. They ask you my children. Our system is based upon the concept of dissent. And what, I'm, what, what I would like to assure the Kenyan people and this commission, is that if I was appointed the Chief Justice, I would have no trouble working with Mr. Kenyatta, who is the President of the Republic of Kenya. I suggest we, we leave this, uh, this particular point for you, Prof, because you are saying there's a view held by Professor Mungai, there's a view held by you. What do you do exactly right? Because I think it for clarity, all of us, it's important to say, I do not if you know if you disagreed with the court ruling. What did you really pen off for clarity? Uh, what I said was, um, and Madam Chair, if I may just um, you know take a minute to just give some context to, the, to, to my answer. Uh, it is not a secret that um, to anyone in the country or to this commission that um, I. Uh, was a frequent commentator on the ICC cases, the International Criminal Court cases. Um, uh, you know, I, uh, my view was that uh, individuals who are charged with crimes against humanity should not offer themselves for the office of the president or deputy president. That was my view at the time. Uh, it is in that context that I express myself in a tweet. Let me just make clear, uh, Professor Mugay, I think you're on Twitter. And I think actually we follow each other. Uh, right there, sir. Yes, <coughs> yes. Uh, you may not always like what I tweet, but you know, we do follow each other. Uh, I, w what I tweeted was, uh, as a matter of the freedom of conscience and thought. Um, I will not recognize Uhuru Kenyatta as the president of Kenya. I can't and I won't. That was a tweet. And that was in the context of the ICC cases. I just want to find out, Professor Mugai, are you through? I'm just winding yeah. up. Yeah, Two quick ones. Winding up. Uh, winding down or winding up, <laughs> Professor? <laughs> you, I may you have know, to take cover if you're you just know, winding you know, up. You know, <laughs> Professor, you went to the alliance, mm -hmm. so your diction and the locution are better. Uh, but uh, I, I, what I intend to say is that I'm finishing my uh, questions. 
Uh, I just want to ask you a personal question, not deeply personal. I would not want to embarrass you. Mm -hmm. But I would want to know, are you a citizen of any other country? Why is that question important? Uh, it is absolutely important because the Constitution of the Republic of Kenya mm -hmm. has very deep views about a public officer mm. who holds the citizenship of another country. Mm. Yep. Uh, what I have said to, to, uh, to everyone uh, is that I have lived in many countries because I was exiled from this country. Uh, I have sought to uh, um, live in a way in which uh, I was not marginalized in those countries. I lived in Tanzania, as you know very well, in exile. I lived in the United States, as you know very well, as well. Um, and I could not come back to Kenya until 1991, when I did uh, come back to this country. Um, I regard myself, quite frankly, as a global citizen. Uh, who is a, I, I'm a Kenyan citizen, but who is a global citizen, quite frankly, uh, Professor Muigai? Uh, I did not choose my circumstances. They were chosen for me. Are you a citizen of the United States? Yes. Would you be willing to renounce the citizenship of a third country if you became the head of the third arm of government in the Democratic Republic of Kenya? Absolutely. That's a good answer. My last question, you just alluded a few minutes ago to the ICC, mm -hmm. uh, and you have said, and uh, I and others respect the freedom of of, of opinion that helps you to hold those views. But I just wanted to know, other than the views, did you become involved in the preparation of the cases that were prosecuted against uh, the two uh, six citizens of the Republic of Kenya? The um, International Criminal Court, um, as you know, Professor, uh, is um, um, a part of the Kenyan judiciary um, uh, because we have uh, ratified the statute, the ICC statute. Uh, we have even domest domesticated the statute uh, through the International Crimes Act. Um, as I recall correctly, when uh, the uh, ICC statute was being uh, drafted, and I think you'd be aware of this as well because I think you participated in, in, in the drafting in the early days because NGOs were very involved in doing uh, the drafting. Uh, there was a lot of support uh, for uh, the concept of an international criminal court. Uh, Let me put a direct question, Professor, so that I save time for my colleagues. Yes. Were you an intermediary of the ICC in the six cases that were being prosecuted in Kenya? Um, if I was an, interme an intermediary of the ICC, you would have known about it, because I think that, that the prosecutor is, is obliged to disclose in intermediaries. So you were not? I was not. I have never been an intermediary um, uh, of, 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 of the ICC, ever. So you didn't procure witnesses, you didn't record statements, you didn't provide safe passage? I have never, um, I don't know what the word procure means. Uh, it's been used uh, by a certain individual in, a, in the popular media. Uh, I rather not use the word procure. I, I don't know whether it is to, I don't know what, what the proper word is. similar was. meaning with what you are thinking. Okay. Mm. No, I, I was never involved in um, uh, encouraging or uh, helping or uh, working with, with witnesses. I'll just say this, um, just for full disclosure, because it is not uh, something that um, uh, I think is in the public domain. I did train. Uh, you know, and I think you know this. Yes. I trained uh, prosecutors and investigators of the ICC, uh, and I thought, and I thought, by so doing, I was in fact fulfilling the obligations of the statute, 
and, and, and my obligations as a human rights scholar and advocate. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have no further questions. Uh, professor, thank you so much for Thank you. Thank you so much for that exchange. I, I need now to move on. Professor Jenda Hood, what you have. Let me move to Commissioner Wicherude. Once again, good morning, Professor. Habari. Yeah. Um, I just want to be sure that um, about who, which Mutua I'm, I'm talking to. <laughs> 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 now that you have multiple personalities. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because um, you are familiar with the Senate confirmation proceedings. Yes. And uh, uh, during those proceedings, everything you've said in public or in private comes to bite you. Yeah, can be used against you. Yes. 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 So no, no, you are talking to all the matures, as it were. <laughs> so, so that, um, you know, t for you to say that when I was tweeting, uh, it was uh, uh, this kind of mutua, and yes. when I did this, it was another mutua. Yes. I mean, you seek to be chief justice for heaven's sake. Yes. And um, sometimes um, an interview like this uh, yes. can be intrusive. Yes. And we must live with it because. Uh, no, no, I, and, and, and Judge, I have no problem. Uh, I, I think that um, I'm an open book. So I, you, you can open any page and we will talk about it. One of the books that I would like to open mm. is in regard to your um, tax obligations in this country because yes. you. you You've worked here, you've been uh, in a task force. Yes. I, I suppose you earned some allowances during that period. Yes. You, you write articles for the uh, standard newspapers. Yes. And you've declared that you get uh, quite some substantial amount of money from it. Yes, yes. And, um, um, and the other thing thing is that under Article 166 and even Chapter 6, mm. the issue of tax is an integrity issue. Yes. And you must declare tax if you earn an income here. Yes. So uh, we just want to be sure that uh, that responsibility uh, is something that you appreciate and yes. that you have fulfilled. I appreciate that responsibility very much, um, but I pay all my taxes in the United States. I don't pay taxes in Kenya, but if, uh, if you are a resident of, of the United States, you are taxed on your global income. It is not just, you know, what, if, if for example, I come to Kenya and I give a talk and you pay me and I go back to the United States, I'll be taxed in the U.S. for that money that you've given me. Now, with respect to, uh, I believe, the task force uh, uh, when I was here, I think they actually took the money off the top. Uh, I don't know what you call it. Um, I don't think it's pay as you earn. But, you know, I, I'm rusty on that one. But I, you know, I think they, they actually took it off the top. So what I'm trying to say, Judge, is that um, I pay my taxes in the United States. I have submitted my, my tax returns. Did you at any point seek um, clearance from our KRA here? Um, so um, uh, that is a subject that I would like to actually go into. Uh, among the two clearances mm -hmm. that I am now awaiting uh, is one from, from the DCI and the other from the KRA. And I'll explain why that is the case. When I applied for this position, I, apl I applied from Washington, and I used my passport, which I have always used as my ID. Um, and uh, I sent my fingerprints, I, I think the registrar, I wrote her a letter, I sent my fingerprints to, um, I sent my fingerprints to, to DCI. Um, the DCI folks, uh, did not respond. So when I came to Kenya, because I came to Kenya shortly thereafter, I went to see them um, on Kiambu Road, and 
uh, the official I saw there told me that, um, in fact, he recognized me and he said, I'm sure you are coming here for the clearance. And he said, well, the only reason why we are not giving you the clearance yet is because you submitted your request with a copy of your passport, not your national ID. I did not know that, I did not know that you needed a national ID to actually get the clearance. Um, my national ID expired. So I applied for another, I applied for a renewal of the national ID. And I was told that once I get the new ID, all I need to do is to go there and they'll give me the clearance. The same thing with the KRA. They just told me I need that, that, uh, that national ID number to, to, to get it. So, so what, what I'm getting at is that I think this is a performer question in my, from where I sit. Performer, you don't think is an integrity question? I mean, because, because all of us mm -hmm. are subject to the Constitution, subject to the rules uh, around um, uh, uh, tax and taxation. Yes. And the only responsible authority that can clear me and clear you yes. would be KRA. Yes. So yes. As, as we sit here and have this conversation, yes. they haven't. Well, I, I mean, I, won't, I, I could not even apply because I didn't have the pen. Okay. So they, they said that I, what I had to do was to get the national ID first, just go to their website and make the application. Let me just say Another thing. Um, yes. You went to Nairobi University. Yes. The University of Nairobi. The University of Nairobi. Yes, yes, yes in 1979. Yes. Uh, because uh, th that was one year after I'd entered the university. So I must have had a bit of time there with you. Now, we, enjoy, we, enjoy, we enjoyed Boom. We enjoyed Boom, isn't it? We enjoyed a loan called Boom. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. And um, it was actually a loan. Yes. And help. Yes is uh, the entity that confirms to all and sundry yes. that those who enjoyed that loan mm -hmm. have repaid it. Mm. Yeah, we didn't see that clearance from there. It's, it's available. You it's available, it? yeah, it's available. You, you made it available? Yes, yes. Okay. I did. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Now, the other... The other issue that I would like us to uh, go into is um, the Kenyan judiciary has had conflicting um, jurisprudence on the issue of intersex persons. One jurisprudence by one judge, uh, just let me just read to you. Yes. It says, the Kenyan society is predominantly a traditional African society in terms of the social, moral, and religious values. We have not reached a stage where such values involve matters of sexuality uh, that can be rationalized or compromised through science, you know, one opinion. Another one says that uh, the fact that births and deaths registration act and constitution not con uh, define the term sex does not mean that we should hide behind the traditional definition as we know it. Time is now ripe for the development of rules and guidelines on corrective surgeries for intersex children, especially minors such as, uh, you know, the minor that they were talking about. What are your views on the status of intersex uh, persons in Kenya? and which uh, high court decision would you associate with, if at all? Um, first of all, let me say that um, the new constitution <coughs> is very clear about uh, the bedrock principle or principles of non-discrimination and equal protection. If there is anything in the constitution that, you know, uh, that is beyond discussion, that cannot be touched, are those two tenets. And those are repeated constantly in almost every chapter. In fact, I would say that if you remove equal protection and non-discrimination from, uh, from the Constitution, the entire document collapses. 
because it's built on those. Um, I think that um, yeah, with respect to not just intersex persons judge, but with respect to questions of sexuality, um, you know, our society needs a larger conversation. Uh, and, and I think our courts can lead our society in having that larger conversation. Um, the, when I look at the equal protection you know, clause of the Constitution, what I see there is a prohibition against discrimination uh, on any person on the basis of any distinction. And I'm talking about obviously non-legal distinctions, such as, for example, sex, marriage, social status, national origin, gender, and so on and so forth, which would include uh, judge, uh, you know, the question of intersexuality. Um, so what I would say is that is that um, uh, I, I, with due respect to the first opinion that you read, uh, which took refuge under African customs and traditions, I would say that ours is a very dynamic society, which, which, which is living uh, in a contemporary world uh, in which we cannot closet ourselves, uh, uh, pardon the, uh, the pun, we cannot closet ourselves um, and simply pretend that, that, um, that values that, uh, that, are, that are trending in the world don't affect us. What I would say is that uh, nature does not choose and ask questions whether Macau is black or white, whether he's a female or male, whether he's intersex, whether he's homosexual. Nature does not ask those questions. You are just what you are. And if, judge, if I may say so, if my son or my daughter was intersex or was gay, what would, what, what would be my obligations to such a child? Would I discriminate against that child? Would I say that the child is not mine? Would I sanction a societal rebuke of my child? And I grant you, uh, Justice Muchelule, I would not. And I know that you would not. And so what I would hope is that our, 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 our judiciary and our constitution, which is enveloped uh, in humanism, and equal protection and a, dis and a discrimination would develop in such a way that, uh, that, uh, that these citizens would be given uh, full rights. Now, of course, Judge, I'm interviewing you with the Chief Justice, so I cannot preclude uh, any ruling that, that, that I might make if I became a judge. But I'm just saying that these are the principles that I think guide, you know, Pro Prof, we are, having, we are having this conversation, and it's live so that Kenyans can can help us judge yes. who the next chief judge is going to be using. Yes, uh, you are talking about courts as being drivers of uh, social change. Yes, I mean, really, that's that is what you are talking about, because there is um, um, the penal code, for instance. There is the constitution that is explicit about certain values, and then it's, it's the courts that you are now saying should drive this uh, social change. Now, listen to this, um, and this is uh, uh, you know, something from the US. Mm -hmm. um, talking about um, whether courts can generate uh, uh, you know, sufficient uh, social reform through litigation. And uh, this writer is saying 
courts are relatively ineffective and weak in comparison to the executive and legislature. Yes. And uh, this write-up was around the issue of uh, Brown versus Board of Education. Yes. Courts as the movers of change. That is change that we are talking about on not just intersex, but eligible time. And the whole question of, yeah. yeah. I would like your comment on that. Yeah, so um, I think uh, I watched an earlier interview in which the, the Attorney General uh, went at some length on this question. So I think I know where it's coming from. And I think it's connected to what he was asking. So I'll, I'll, um, uh, perhaps I can satisfy him and you at the same time. Um, the, the, I, I, let me analogize uh, the body politic to a human body, OK? Uh, the body politic is, is, is the state, right? It is the judiciary, the executive, and the legislature. If you analogize you know, the body politic to the human body, I would say that uh, the executive is the heart, uh, the legislature are the lungs, and the judiciary is the brains. I, I don't, I'm not creating a hierarchy there. I'm just naming them, uh, just for the sake, so that, so that people can really grasp the idea of the three arms of government and how they work together. If you look at how those three body parts work together, organs, they are independent of each other, but they are interdependent. If the brain dies, the others surely will die. Okay? So, so what I want to say is that, um, is that uh, the, 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 the democratic sort of structure of government is, is, is based on a healthy tension of checks and balances, but also of cooperation between the arms of government, because they are all part of the same state. Oh. Professor, mm -hmm. the issue that I was raising had nothing to do with our relationship with the other no, state no, no, agencies. But no. let, me, let, me just, mm. let me just interrupt. My, my issue is in regard to these social uh, events, social values. Yes. No, no, I was coming there, Judge. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, I was okay, coming okay. there. I was just, uh, I was just putting, it, putting a, uh, a canvas on it. Uh, it. So the judiciary, um, in effect, does not make law. OK? In my view, the judiciary, the judiciary um, develops law. And it develops law in a way in which, by looking at the Constitution, it gives effect to the spirit and the black letter law of that Constitution. OK? So on a question, for example, where there are gray areas, or where perhaps the law is silent, uh, as it is on the issues that you raise, and it's unclear on the issues that you raise, I think only the judiciary, in my view, can is vested with the judicial power, which obviously comes from the people, to help the country move forward in understanding those tensions and gray areas that um, you know that 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 we're talking about. Um, I mean, there are other areas as well, Judge, like, for example, forced evictions. We don't have a law, really, to deal with that particular question. Uh, there are other areas, like uh, the death penalty, where th there's a contest as to what actually th the Constitution means with respect to that, that particular one. So what I would say is that, uh, is that, yes, the courts are an important aspect of social transformation and change. Um, but 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 the reason why I was giving the the, 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 the expansive explanation about uh, the three arms of government, it is just to make sure that we understand that the courts are their own lane, and they should stay in their lane. Professor, now if you become chief justice, you will be the chair person of this commission. Yes, and its primary function is to promote, facilitate the independence and accountability of the judiciary and efficient, effective, transparent administration of justice. Mm -hmm. That is our number one uh, uh, mandate. Yes. In practical terms, mm. how would you 
enable this commission to realize that mandate? Um, thank you. First of all, I think it is wonderful uh, that the new constitution uh, put in place an independent judicial service commission. That is not subject to the control of any arm of government. The JSC is not even subject to the control of the judiciary. So in effect, the JSC controls itself in that sense. Um, however, I think the JSC um, uh, is best, in my view, uh, when it exercises its power um, to to set broad areas of policy for the judiciary, uh, to handle difficult questions within the judiciary, um, to act as an interlocutor with other arms of government, if that is necessary, in defense of the judiciary. I think that the, 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 the particular question where there is some tension is about where the Chief Justice uh, is the head of the judiciary on one hand, but also the chair of the commission. Uh, my view is that uh, this is not a, a, you know, a, uh, a perfect solution. But I have been unable to think of any other that would work better. So I think what I've thought about is, is, is just creating a relationship of consultation and collaboration between the Chief Justice and the GSC. Uh, the, I, I've often said this, Judge, that, uh, that uh, if you look at structures of, or institutions, they are composed of norms and processes and structures and people. And quite often, people forget that in that equation of norms, processes, and institutions, that people are the most important resource. So in my view, I think it's incumbent upon the Chief Justice to work in a collegial way uh, not just with the you know, judges and, and magistrates and others, but especially with the JSC. Um, because I think that if, if, if we want to realize the vision uh, of the judiciary that is in the Constitution judge, this commission must function and must function well. It means that the Chief Justice and the commission must really be, you know, uh, I'm not saying that they, sh that they should always think like one, because that would not be good, but they should have, a, have this, you know, healthy relationship that, that uh, which will make them move forward. Looking at the judiciary from the US. Yes. Um, because you've written quite a bit about it. Yes. What would you regard as uh, uh, being our, the successes of the judiciary under Chief Justice Mutunga, mm -hmm. and what would you consider to be the challenges? Mm. But I think uh, the, the important thing is that if you realize there are challenges, if you became Chief Justice, how would you surmount those challenges? Yes. Um, I think that, um, and, and I don't think I speak out of school, you know, when I say that, um, that our judiciary was for a long time challenged uh, by a number of factors. Among them, I think, um, ethics, uh, interference by other arms of government. I think, um, you know, being captured by, by, you know, private interests and so on. What I think some people have called cartels and so on. Uh, when I wrote that article that I was referring to earlier in my conversation with Professor Mungai, about uh, the Kenyan judiciary. I talked about, you know, that very dark era for the judiciary. 
where judges could be appointed at midnight and fired in the morning. Um, where you, our, our judiciary was a judiciary of technicalities because it, our judiciary did not want to do substantive justice. Um, you know, Fast, fast forward to, to, uh, to 2010. Uh, actually, just go back to 2003, uh, uh, where a number of judges were appointed uh, to come to the judiciary uh, under the NARC administration. Uh, I want to say that that was the first time, and I hope I don't offend anyone when I say this, that I think new blood began to be injected into the judiciary in a very positive way. You, one of them is sitting here. Uh, I think Justice uh, Wasame. Uh, maybe not. Uh, but, uh, but there are others like Justice Lenaula, you, know, uh, you know, who was part of that. Those judges have been very good, I must say. Uh, but, but fast forward to 2011 with a new, with a new crop of judges that came in. I say that one of the most important successes of the Mutunga era, as I want to call it, was the expansion of the magistracy and the judiciary in terms of personnel, judges. And not just uh, this dichotomy of insider outsider, which I think is a false narrative, but just recruiting people because they are good and they are competent and they love their country. And we've seen already, we began to see the, the progress that, that, that's been made. That, to me, is a, a reform that is singular in its importance. The second thing I want to say is, is and that should continue, by the way. That should continue. Uh, and, and I hope that in continuing that revamping of the judiciary with new magistrates and judges and so on, um, that we can we can, we can set aside this, this dichotomy of insider-outsider. Because all of us love our country and, and we want to, to serve it. You know, uh, there's no need to create wedges uh, you know, between ourselves. Um, I think that, I think that so, so that's important. That should continue for sure because we need magistrates, we need judges in this country in the furthest reaches of the republic. The second question really was one of, um, of access to justice. Um, this country has a woeful record on, for the inability of our citizens to access justice. You know, um, there was often the, the, the phrase that uh, why hire you know, a lawyer when you can buy a judge? I'm sure you've heard that, that, that particular dark expression. You know, people just felt that they could not access justice. So, so I would say, I would say, Judge, that uh, that that's an important one. I would say, in terms of the court itself, you know, uh, the infrastructure, the technology, uh, the question of uh, creating the the, the, the judicial, judiciary fund so that you can protect the judiciary from control by other arms of government, very very important. The building of just courts, very important. One area that I think, uh, and, and th all those should continue, by the way. The other area that I think is, is important, two areas, Judge. One, I think that magistrates, I, I, and, and perhaps the commission can argue with me about this question. I think we need to consider giving magistrates statutory tenure. Magistrates hear about 70% of all the cases, perhaps more. Why is it that they have no, they don't have any form of tenure? You know, I think that is a question that our legislature can look at, uh, because I think you know, doing it through the Constitution is a, is a very difficult process. But you can do statutory tenure for magistrates, uh, because they do so much work. Uh, as do other judicial staff, by the way. But for magistrates in particular, I would like to this is one thing I would, I, would, I would propose. The second, the last thing I want to say about, um, um, about uh, what I would do differently, uh, I think there are um, aspects of the judiciary where continuous learning is taking place. I think JTI was one of them, 
the Judicial Transformation Institute is one of them. Uh, I think that should certainly continue. But I think, Judge, that, um, that, um, that for example, what Justice Moraga is doing with, with elections, there's a committee, I believe, doing elections. That's wonderful. I don't see why there cannot be other committees on specific issues. Because that's how you accumulate a wealth of knowledge as a judiciary. Um. Bombers, you didn't.